Hello and welcome to Biodiversity and Conservation 1. This is the beginning of our second to last unit, Unit 18, which we'll be first talking about how we are going to categorize life. And then from there, we will get into how do we quantify life. So how do we establish like a number, basically, when talking about an environment? How much biodiversity? How many different species do we have? And then from there, what does that number mean in terms of the stability of that ecosystem? Now, uh, we're not going to, and then from there, we're also getting into conservation and later PBTs, which we'll be talking about how do humans affect um, these, these biodiversity numbers and what, do, what are our responsibilities in order to protect these animals? Okay, so we're moving on today. The first PBT will be dealing about the classification. In classification, we'll be looking at the idea of taxonomy, which you guys might remember from year 10. I did uh, a unit early on in year 10 about this, when we talked about taxon taxonomical hierarchy, or the idea of our domain, kingdoms, phylums, class, order, family, genus, and species, or how we group different uh, species all over the earth, and how do we organize and classify them so that we, we can understand them better when we're doing our research. Uh, then we're going to look at the domains, the three major domains of life and the characteristics of those domains. We'll be looking at the characteristics of the major kingdoms. There are four or uh, five major kingdoms. Sorry, there's five major kingdoms in addition to the four that you see there. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about all five major kingdoms on this PPT. And then last, we'll be looking a little bit more at virus classification. Uh, if you remember, viruses uh, cannot be classified the same way as everything else because viruses do not have the same uh, characteristics of living things uh, as everything else. So we'll have to use a different type of system in order to classify viruses. Okay, so make sure you learn these outcomes because if you don't... You have failed me for the last time. Yay, more Star Wars stuff. Let's see if I can just try to put as much Star Wars stuff into this this PPT uh, this year with my PPTs as possible. Yay, Star Wars. I hope you all have seen the movie by now and enjoyed the movie. Okay, so when we talk about classification, let's just do a quick classification exercise right now. So here you see a picture of a bunch of random stuff. Uh, what I want you to do is just pause the video for a couple of, uh, for a minute or two. And just real quickly down your notes, just figure out all the different ways you could group these items. What are different ways that you could group them? Um, and then just unpause the video and then see which, which ways uh, you've thought of and uh, which ways I've thought of. And we'll see uh, who's more creative. You'll probably be more creative than me. Okay, so pause the video and just think, okay, how, uh, how would I categorize these things? How would I group them? Okay, did you pause it? Hope you paused it. Okay, so one of the ways, really right off the bat, it's pretty easy. You could group them. Is you could do it by color, right? That would be pretty easy. You could take the ones that are red, the ones that are blue, the ones that are yellow, and you could put them all into one single group of reds, blues, and yellows, right? So that's a really simple way to break down this this jumbled mess of randomness. Another thing you could do is group it by things that are living things and non-living things. We see stuff like a pineapple, a pig, a crab, a frog, an insect. Those are all living things, where a lot of the other things will be non-living things, right? You could group it by whether or not it is a weapon. That's one that students always tend to pick up on really quickly. Here's a weapon, here's a weapon, here's a weapon, here's a weapon. Yeah, so you could group them by things that are weapons and things that are not weapons. You could group them by things that would be made out of metal versus things that would not be made out of metal. You could group them by things that are used in sports uh, versus things that are not used in sports. You could group them by clothing versus non-clothing, um, uh, things like that. Things that are tools versus things that are not tools. Things that maybe they're just toys or just things for fun. So there's lots of lots of different ways that you could group all of these together and you could actually make groups within groups so first off we could start by saying uh, we'll separate them by color so we have all the reds and all the blues and all the yellows and we'll separate them and then within the red group we could say okay of the red things which ones are 
weapons, which ones are toys, which ones are clothing. And within the blue group, which one are clothing, which one's a toy, which one's a weapon, things like that, right? So we could, uh, we could classify them in different ways, maybe very, very more general. And then we do classification inside of a classification, getting more and more specific. So when we do things like this, we're essentially doing uh, classification and tax taxonomy. So classification is basically when you group objects together based on their similarities. And this is not uh, uncommon for you guys, I would hope, because you've probably been doing this almost every day of your life. You've been grouping things together. You, When you were a little kid, you saw... You saw a truck or a car, uh, you have maybe had a toy truck and a toy car, and you see that it has a, a body shape and it has a front and a back and has four wheels and it rolls along on the ground and you think, okay, well, that's, that's a car. So maybe when you were young, everything you saw that looked like that, you called it a car, whether or not it was a car or a truck or a bus or a train, something that looked like that. You said, oh, that's all a car. And as you learn and you get older and you get more information, your parents start teaching you like some of these are cars and some of these are motorcycles and some of these are trucks and some of these are buses. Some of these are vans, right? And you start getting more and more specific about what is and is not a car, right? So classification, we've been doing it, uh, we do it almost uh, uh, without thinking. It's, it's, it's one of the easiest ways that we learn as human beings is to classify things. We like to classify things. Now in biology, when we classify living things, we call that taxonomy. And so really taxonomy is just the classification of living things. So we will take all of the species all over the earth and we need to put them into groups. And we're going to name them um, in different taxa level, different organization levels, based on their different characteristics. And when we learn about a new species or we're studying a brand new species, it helps us gain information about that species by comparing it to ones that we know that exist already and where do they fit inside the taxonomy of that type of species. So this has actually been happening for a very, very long time. The first person to actually write it down and, and organize it in some type of system was Aristotle. You guys remember Aristotle? Maybe you've seen a picture of him before. Very smart guy, right? It will be cool to hang out with Aristotle for a day. Uh, and he started classification, but he was very, very general and not really the most scientifically accurate way of doing it. Uh, so animals versus plants, that's actually, that's pretty good, right? The animals versus plants, they're very, very different. When we talk about cells, the first thing we start learning is animal cells versus plant cells. We did anatomy last year. We talked about the animal circulatory system versus the plant's transportation system things like that, right? So animals and plants, that's not that big of a deal. But then going into other things like flying versus walking, that's not super uh, specific because there's lots of things that walk and there's lots of things that fly. Like a butterfly and a bird are both flying creatures, but a butterfly and a bird are very, very different from each other. There are lots of other characteristics that, are, that make them very different. So maybe flying versus walking isn't the best way to categorize things. Or another way that they did it was the number of legs, animals that had two legs versus animals that had four legs. Uh, and that again, uh, it's okay to classify things by the number of legs at a certain point. For example, for insects, uh, it's, it's easier for comparing different types of uh, arachnids uh, versus insects but by the number of legs or crustaceans by the number of legs. But uh, in all of life or general life, uh, four versus two legs, those are, those are kind of broad categories, maybe not really that specific. So anyway, uh, so we have a, a better system now, but in, until uh, the, 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 the new system came along, this is really kind of what everybody was doing. They're following this model of it. It's either one type or it's another type. So then we didn't really get a great new system until the Linnaeus system came around. And so we had Carlos Linnaeus, this handsome man right here. Does he look so dapper, so debonair? And he basically came up with a binomial system. And a binomial system means that it is built on two names, two specific names. Uh, and we will call, and they're written in Latin. So we choose two specific Latin names. And these two Latin names will make up the name that we scientists will use for referring to a specific species. So the first name is always the genus name, and the second name is called the specific epithet, which we will call the species name. So every creature on Earth has a genus and a species name, 
And this is how it works into the Linnaeus system. And this is what biology is based on now. We use the Linnaeus system to organize everything. So for example, we can have a name like Panthera Leo. What do you guys think Panthera Leo means? I mean, you remember this from 10th grade. We talked about this example. It's a Panthera Leo. Panthera, the genus name, is for large cats, a very specific groups of large cats. And Leo, being the specific epithet or species names, means lion. So Panthera Leo is the specific or the species name for a lion. Now there are different types of lions. There are African lions, there are Asian lions. Um, so we would have to be more specific. We would have maybe a subspecies, Panthera Leo, and then another name, a third name that would talk about the specific subspecies of animal that we're talking about. But we're just talking about a lion, like the general idea of what a lion is, we would call it a Panthera Leo, okay? Now, using this system, though, we can help us organize and think about how to categorize similar species, things that are similar in body type, morphology, behavior. So, for example, if I said a Panthera tigris, what do you think a Panthera tigris is going to be? So, you already know that Panthera means something that is a large cat, a big, big cat. And tigris, you've probably already figured out, is referring to a tiger. Now, we know that lions and tigers are very different from each other, but they do have very, very similar morphology. They are both large cats. They have retractable claws here. They have pads on their feet. They have these rounded, pointy ears they use for hearing. They have strong, carnivorous jaws and large fangs for eating meat, and they typically only eat meat. Uh, their behaviors are very similar, the way that they, they live either in groups or in isolation, the way they fight for dominancy, the way they hunt animals in order to gain food. Uh, they're very, very similar to each other in, in different ways. So we can put them all the way down to the genus name of, or sharing the same genus name of Panthera. And then from there, they separate into their different groups by either being called Leo or Tigris with their species name. So a couple of rules about the Linnaeus system real quick. First off, the first name, the genus name, always must be capitalized. The species name is always going to be lowercase. Okay, Leo should always be a lowercase L and Tigris should always be a lowercase T. And the entire name is always supposed to be written in italics or the slanty type of curvy writing that you see on your computer when sometimes you accidentally push uh, I, the uh, control I instead of shift I. So you're trying to do a capital I and you accidentally do italics instead. So uh, on an exam, you should either write in italics with slanty letters, or you could also underline. If you write it in regular uh, writing like this, very sloppy writing like that, uh, and you want to say that, oh, this is supposed to be italicized, you can underline it. Underlining on a on written section would, would show that it's supposed to be italicized, but of course you didn't write in a slanty way. Okay? So those are just the rules for the Linnaeus system. And now let's look at uh, the grander scheme of how it's structured. Okay, so categorizing two very, very similar species using a genus and a species name, uh, that's not really that hard. That's, 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 uh, it's, we're just looking at very, very small differences between two different species. But we have a taxonomical hierarchy. Uh, so this taxonomic hierarchy uh, basically breaks all of ca all these comparisons that we do for all living things into um, different taxa. So we're doing our classification. Uh, we're going to be using specific inclusive groups called taxa, and they get more and more specific as you move down through them. And the taxa are inclusive. So once we say, okay, here's one big group, we're not going to say here's another group. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to take of that group, we're going to take a smaller group, and of that group, a smaller group, and then the smaller group, and then the smaller group, and then the smaller group. So it's inclusive. So we're breaking the group down into more and more specific classifications. So you should try to memorize all of these, and you need to memorize the order that they occur in uh, so that you either can answer an exam question or you at least understand what they're talking about on an exam. So first up, we have our domain, our kingdom, phylum, our class, our order, our family, our genus, and last, our species. So we already know about genus and species. We're going to learn more about domains and kingdoms today. And then phylum, class, order, and family. They're just more specific taxa, but there's so many types of phylum, class, orders, and families 
that uh, we're not going to get into the specifics of them. So we have to know about domains and kingdoms, and then you have to understand what a gen genus and a species name are. So when we talk about uh, a hierarchy, so we can look at something like this. Oh yeah, sorry, and we can have subspecies as well. Uh, for example, when a species kind of separates uh, but hasn't had full speciation yet, they're starting to get different types of categories. For example, we talked about uh, salamander subspecies or snake subspecies, snakes that have different color patterns but are still the same species, we would give them a subspecies name based on their color pattern. So here's an example of a hierarchy. So uh, for our domain eukarya, meaning eukaryotes or complicated cells or cells with the nucleus, for example. So all of the eukaryote organisms, we want to look specifically at the kingdom animalia, which means for animals, so things that have animal traits, so we don't want to use plants or fungi. Uh, then from there we want to look at our phylum of chordata, meaning the animals that have a backbone, so that gets rid of uh, insects, for example. Then we will look at mammalia, meaning mammals, so we don't want to look at snakes or birds, we want to specifically look at, uh, at mammals. Then our carnivora, which means these are carnivores or meat-eating mammals. Then we have our, our cordea, okay, which is a type, of, or sorry, canidea, which is a type of uh, uh, hounds or wolves or dogs, very, very um, uh, general or more wild forms of dogs. Then we get into our genus, which is canis, which is a more domesticated or local form of our canine species, which we, our canine groups would be like things like dogs and wolves and coyotes. Then we want to get into our subspecies, which would be our canis lupus, which could be anything from dogs or wolves. Dogs and wolves are very, very similar to each other, so they actually carry the same genus and species name. And we want to talk about a domesticated dog, though. We're going to have to go into the subspecies le level. So we have a canis lupus familiaris, or basically a domesticated dog. So our wolf would be, for example, an undomesticated dog. So we just call it a, a, a canis lupus instead of a canis lupus familiaris. So we can see how we've gone from eukarya, a very, very general group, all the way down to one specific species, a subspecies actually, by going through this hierarchy. And you need to make sure you understand the order. Domain. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and then, of course, subspecies. I'm sure, after looking at all of those really, really long names, and all of them being relatively foreign to you, and how we categorize something simple like a house dog, you're probably thinking, why can't we just use the simple names that we uh, would use for animals? Why do we have to use this complicated system? So for example, with these animals, you should be able to name all of them, right? Take a minute, you name all of them? Of course, I'm asking you to name them in English, right? So you can name this one as a giraffe, this is called a jaguar, this is a fox, specifically a red fox, and that's a dolphin, right? Of course, the problem with this, though, is that you're naming these things in English, and not everyone speaks English. You would have different names for these animals. Uh, if you're using this in Chinese or in Spanish or in French and uh, The idea of the giraffe or a jaguar or a dolphin or a fox those actually aren't really specific enough Under the idea of what a fox is there's many different types of foxes. There are gray foxes. There are white foxes There are arctic foxes. There are red foxes There are different types of giraffes depending on where part of the world they come from there are black jaguars, there are yellow jaguars, like the one you see there. There are different types of dolphins. There are bottle nose dolphins, there are finless dolphins that don't have a back dorsal fin. So uh, it's not really the best way in terms of specific, and it's not really the best way in terms of communication, because people speak different languages. And in science, we want to be very, very specific, and we want to be very clear. So we don't use common names, we stick to our naming system so that everyone is speaking the same language and that we are being very specific about what type of species or even subspecies we are referring to. So we just don't use common names. We would use, for example, this for giraffe, this for our red fox, which is called vulpus vulpus, our dolphin, or for our jaguar. And yes, I know it's a little bit more complicated 
and it's a lot more uh, uh, learning how to spell all these complicated names when you get older and you start doing taxonomy for a career, but at least it's very clear whenever you're reading these. Uh, and just out of, as a note, of course all the spelling and the names might be a little weird for us because it is done in Latin. Anybody know why we use Latin as our scientific writing language? Uh, remember this from year 10? Well, there's a couple reasons for why we always use Latin. First off, is that the, a lot of languages are based in Latin, a lot of Western languages are based in Latin, so sometimes it's not too hard in terms of pronunciation or spelling or uh, understanding the connection between uh, the Latin word and the English word or German word or Spanish word or French word. Another thing about Latin though is that it is a dead language. And being a dead language, there isn't any country that speaks Latin. There is no native people anywhere in the world that speaks Latin. So that means that Latin doesn't change. The rules for Latin, for the way that we, we conjugate Latin words and the Latin vocabulary and the Latin spelling and the Latin pronunciation, it never changes over time because nobody is adding to it. We're only just keeping it exactly the way it is. It is preserved in time and will be remained unchanged because it is a dead language. It is only used really for these scientific uh, purposes. It's not really used in any other forms. We don't add to the language, we just use the language uh, in our naming process. Okay, so I hope you found that a little interesting on the history of why we are doing the naming system this way. Okay, so now for the rest of the PPT, I want to talk about the domains in the kingdoms that make up the first levels of our taxa. Uh, now, before we start about the three different domains, um, one of the kingdoms that I want to bring up for, uh, so it goes domain, which is our highest level, or uh, which is made up of three different groups, our eukarya, our prokarya, and our archaria. And then we have five kingdoms. And there are one kingdom that is specific for simple cells like a bacteria in archaea, and that is our prokaryota or prokaryotes. You guys should remember prokaryotes as their vocabulary word, right? Our, our scientific word for basically simple cells. So we have the kingdom of prokaryota, and then all of the other kingdoms are made up of eukaryotic cells, okay? So even though I want to start with the domains, I just want to bring up this kingdom of prokaryota because prokaryota is actually just made up of, of um, of two different domains, or two different domains also use the prokaryota kingdom, and then our third domain will be used uh, using all of the other kingdoms that we have. So this might be, this isn't confusing, but so we have prokaryota, which is actually made up of our archaea domain and our bacteria domain. And the reason why we put archaea and bacteria into the prokaryota kingdom, or why they both fit with prokaryota kingdom, is because they are simple cells. They do not have membrane-bound uh, nucleus. They do not have membrane-bound organelles. Um, they don't have um, a linear DNA. They have circular DNA. And so because of this, uh, they are very, very similar to the idea, uh, they're very similar to each other structurally, so we will put them in the prokaryota kingdom. Okay, so uh, let's look at the two different domains though. So our three domains that make up all of life are archaea, bacteria, and the eukaryota. Now the eukarya obviously are going to be the eukaryotic cells, the, the larger, more complex cells. And so there are four kingdoms that eukarya will branch off into. And our archaea and our bacteria will both branch off into our prokarya, our prokaryota, sorry. So let's look at each one of these domains individually, okay? So our first domain, archaea. Archaea, we've talked about this a couple of forms, but archaea could possibly be the oldest forms of life on Earth. That's why we call them archaea, or like uh, ancient, archaic. Uh, and they are uh, categorized as being extremophiles. That is their big interesting point. And that they can survive, or they have the ability to survive in really, really high uh, acidic conditions, like here in, in a, a, a thermal vent, very, very high temperatures. Sorry, not here, a thermal vent and a geyser. Here's a geyser. Here in a thermal vent, down at the bottom of the ocean, uh, where basically uh, hot magma streams under the earth are, are meeting the water of the ocean, and it's creating this really, really, really hot water, high above 100 degrees Celsius. And very, very, because it's very deep in the ocean as well, 
uh, it's, uh, it's under a lot of pressure. And here we have salt planes. And salt planes have a very, very high um, salinity, a very, very high salt concentration. Typically, salt kills most bacteria. That's why we salt our food in olden times, was to protect it from bacteria when we were storing it. But, uh, but extremophiles can survive in these, these crazy conditions where pretty much all eukaryotic and prokaryotic life would die. So they live in high temperatures, high pH, high salinity. Uh, they're very, very similar to bacteria, but they do have a couple of things that are make them more like uh, eukaryotes. For example, they do transcription, kind of like eukaryotes do, uh, not like bacteria do. They have cell wall that is made out of cellulose, uh, which is different from bacteria. Bacteria do not use cellulose cell walls. They use a peptoglycan uh, type of cell walls, where uh, eukaryotes use uh, cellulose, most, mostly use cellulose-based cell walls. Um, our other domain, of course, is our bacteria. And bacteria you should be very familiar with. Just remember that they don't have a nucleus. They have what we call a nucleoid, which is just a ball of DNA. They have uh, circular chromosomes, and they also use plasmids for getting additional DNA when necessary. Uh, no membrane-bound organelles. They don't have a mitochondria. They don't have a Golgi complex. They don't have uh, uh, chloroplasts. They have small ribosomes, and this is actually true for... Our archaea as well. Our archaea have a small ribosomes as well. We say 70s ribosomes. Eukaryotic cells have larger ribosomes. We call it 80s. Uh, and just like archaea as well, they're pretty much going to be unicellular. Sometimes the cells will kind of group together and they'll form uh, colonies, but they are pretty much unicellular. They do not um, work together. Uh, in order to build a large, or larger, more complicated organism, they, they really work out only for themselves. Uh, and then, of course, their cell walls, not having cellulose, they have peptoglycans. It's a different compound, different from cellulose, but it, it works very similar to cellulose when making a cell wall. Okay, so these are the first two domains, our archaea and our bacteria, and remember, they both will lead into the prokaryota kingdom. And then prokaryotic kingdom is basically just bacteria and archaea. So everything I've just described to you, that's what prokaryota uh, kingdom would be like as well. Okay, from here I'm going to jump into the, the last domain, which is our eukarya, before I talk about each of the kingdoms that eukarya uh, go into. Okay, so the third domain, sorry, third domain, uh, would be our eukarya, and our eukarya are all our complicated cells, and from here we have four kingdoms that eukarya go into. So we have our protocystia, which is our protists, it's easier to say than protocystia, our fungi, our plants, our plantiae, and our animalia, or our animals. Now you should remember eukaryotic cells because we've talked about them in great details last year when we talked about cell organelles and before. Uh, they are large, complicated cells. That means they will have a nucleus, and they will have membrane-bound organelles. So they have a mitochondria, they will have a Golgi apparatus. If they are plant cells, they will have a cytoplasm, or not cytoplasm, uh, chloroplast. Um, they have linear DNA, really, really long linear DNA. They will not use plasmids. They have larger ribosomes, which we call ADS ribosomes. Uh, yeah, mitochondria. Uh, another thing as well is that they will divide by mitosis, uh, instead of like eukarya and or bacteria and archaea, bacteria and archaea are going to divide by binary fission, which basically means they divide in half, um, where eukaryotic cells are going to do the more slower, complicated division, which is mitosis, which we've learned about. Okay, so now that I've kind of gone through eukaryotic cells, again, you should remember a lot of that detail from years before when eukaryotic cell is. Let's talk about the four kingdoms that we can then break eukarya down into. So eukarya, first off, let's start with the simplest forms, would be our protocystas. And a protocysta is basically the leftover group. So everything that is not a plant, that's not an animal, and is not a fungi, pretty much gets put into the protocysta group, or is considered a protist. So for example, an amoeba like this. This amoeba is a large, complicated cell. It's a eukaryotic cell. It does not form... A multicellular organism is a single cellular organism. Uh, it is not a plant or a fungi or an animal, so really you could just call it a protist. Here is a paramecium as well, same thing. 
It's not as complicated as a plant, an animal, or a fungi. It doesn't have the same properties. It's just a unicellular eukaryotic cell. So we're going to call it a protist or our volvox here. Volvox is, um, does have some photosynthetic capability. So it does have uh, the green pigments, the chlorophyll. Uh, it doesn't have chloroplast. It's not a plant. It's not a fungi. It can form multicellular balls, but they do not work together and form like tissues or organs. They're still kind of individual cells, uh, but they're kind of stuck together to help each other survive a little bit better. But still, uh, they're not as complex uh, organisms like plants, animals, or fungi. So again, we put them in our protist group. Or last, our diatoms. I remember if I talked about diatoms before, but these guys are really, really important. Uh, they also can do photosynthesis. Again, um, uh, they might, uh, I think they have chloroplasts. Uh, so they can do photosynthesis, and they actually make most of the air that we breathe comes from them. So yes, plants and trees are very important in order for stability of an ecosystem and for removing carbon dioxide and creating oxygen through, for photosy through photosynthesis, but actually diatoms, which basically will live in any water that is a healthy source of water. So anywhere where their life can survive in a water source. If there are diatoms, then an ecosystem can be built. If there are no diatoms, that means that that water or that ecosystem is definitely polluted or there's something wrong with it uh, because even diatoms will not survive there. But diatoms are just these simple uh, single cellular protists. They come in uh, hundreds of different types and they make tons and tons of oxygen because there's so many of them and there's so much water all over the earth. They actually end up making about 43% of the oxygen that we drink, uh, the oxygen that we can breathe on Earth. Okay, so anything that is a eukaryote that is not a plant, a fungi, or an animal has to be considered a protist. So the protist characteristics are relatively similar to just that of a eukaryotic cell: nucleus, uh, membrane-bound organelles. Uh, a lot of them will have cilia and flagella, uh, things like that. They'll have some type of oral groove, some uh, place where they kind of eat or material, typically dead material or small bacteria, uh, will come into the cell and then it will get digested through lysosomes inside of the cell and then they'll have an anal pore or they have some place where the waste material gets dumped out. Okay, so they have very, very similar body plans. It's not going to all be exactly the same. Uh, but we can break them down into two different types, basically. Uh, so being eukaryotic, they have nucleus membrane-bound organelles. They're going to be mostly unicellular. But the two different types are basically a protozoa, uh, which would be an animal-like. So that means that they don't have a cell wall and they will be heterotrophic. So for example, this paramecium here does not have a cell wall. It's relatively flexible uh, and it is heterotrophic. It will use its oral groove here to eat either waste material that it comes across or it will eat other cells, um, typically small bacteria cells that can fit inside the oral groove. Same thing would go for the amoeba. The amoeba will wrap its flexible um, cell body around the cell, kind of like a white blood cell does, and then it will digest the bacteria. So it'll be heterotrophic, so it'll eat things in order to survive. Um, the other type would be uh, a plant-like things, things like algae. Uh, algae are, di are things like diatoms as well, or volvox, those are other examples of our algae groups. Uh, they are photosynthetic, and they will have a cellulose-based cell walls. And so they, they're basically just like individual plant cells floating around in a solution. So they, they act just like plant cells, but they don't form large, complicated organisms like a plant does. Now, next up, let's talk about our fungi. Like this. This is our fungi there. A hey, magic mushroom. Gonna help make Mario big, right? But actually, you might not know that that's based on a real mushroom that you can find in Japan. You see it here. I actually think it's a poisonous mushroom. I have to look that up. Um, but yes, there is a mushroom that that video game icon fungi is based on in real life. So uh, fungi basically are plants. Uh, uh, sorry, not plants. They look like plants. Uh, they're not plants. But they do not act like plants. So often people get very confused uh, about the idea of whether or not a fungi actually do photosynthesis and they, they do not. They do look like plants. They do have uh, cell walls and they do have root system, a very basic root system. 
and a very similar transport system that we would see kind of like what we have in plants, but they do not have chloroplasts and they do not do photosynthesis. Okay, repeat that, they do not do photosynthesis. Sometimes students still get confused by this. They are heterotrophic. They're actually part of our decomposing groups. So they will typically break down already dead material uh, and the process of breaking it down, they're contributing to the recycling of material in our ecosystem. So here we are, or remember our food chain, for example. So here we have fungi growing out of a insect that they've overtaken and the insect died. And then as the insect's body is decomposing and breaking apart, the fungi is releasing uh, enzymes and uh, chemicals onto the tissue in order to help break it down. And as they break it down, the, the body is supplying energy needed for the fungus to grow. Uh, more cells do mitosis, get larger, eventually it creates spores and then it will reproduce through spores. So things of uh, fungi that you should keep track of, uh, they're obviously going to be eukaryotic. They're going to be unicellular or multicellular depending on the part of their life cycle. Uh, typically during this part of the life cycle here, that's multicellular, there's many, many cells that are making that large complex organism. And then when they release the spores, the spores will have a short unicellular life uh, where they will grow and they'll um, get larger and then it's more stable and then they'll start to reproduce. And then once they start to reproduce, they will restart a multicellular life. So there are actually two different parts of the life cycle. There's a multicellular type uh, part of the life cycle and there will be a unicellular part of the life cycle. Uh, they were produced by spores. Again, those are unicellular and gametes. And these gametes uh, have the ability to do mitosis even with half of the genetic information so that they can grow into a larger uh, organism before going through sexual reproduction, before maybe interacting with a male and female gametes interacting with each other. So that's not for all spores, but there are some spores that can do that where they have their own little growth period before they actually meet with the, uh, the other female gamete and, and complete the life cycle. Uh, they'll have cell walls, but it's not made out of cellulose. It's actually made out of chitin. Uh, chitin is actually the type of material that the insect's exoskeleton is made out of. So the hard section of this insect here is the same chemical that the cell walls of fungi are made out of. And that's kind of important to show why fungi are particularly good at uh, attacking um, insects. Uh, fungi have evolved, uh, lots of different fungi have evolved to specifically attack specific species of insects. Not all insects, but maybe just a specific species of insect. Uh, just in order to get uh, the energy from those, uh, those insects, but also to get the chitin that's already been made for them. Uh, and they can, they can break it down and reorganize it in order to build their own cell walls. And then last, uh, they're never going to have cilia or flagella. So that's one of the physical characteristics that you can be sure of. They don't have cilia or flagella. And there are long little thread sections that kind of look like roots, but aren't really roots. They're not as sophisticated or as well designed as roots. They're called our hyphea. And basically that's what the body is going to be made up of. You're going to take more and more strands of hyphea, and then from there you can get a form a stock and you can form other sections of the uh, of the of the fungus cap basically from these uh, these long thread parts okay so that's our fungi remember again heterotrophic not photosynthetic okay so the last ones really easy plantia or plants they look like plants because they are plants they're plants we've talked about plants a lot last year so you really should know what a plant is by now. It's a multicellular heterotroph or uh, eu eukaryotic. Um, sorry, it's a multicellular eukaryotic organism. It is photosynthetic, meaning it is autotroph. It does not consume organisms. It is not heterotrophic. It is autotrophic. It has cell walls that are made of cellulose. It has some flagella. Sometimes some parts of the plants will have flagella. Uh, and then it has all the other parts of a plant cell that we've talked about in great detail before. So, yeah, it's a plant. Um, you should know what a plant is by now. And then, of course, our last kingdom is our animalia or our animals. Uh, they don't look like plants because they are not plants. 
uh, even ones that look like plants, like these leaf bugs, are still animals, not plants, even though they might look like plants. Okay, so some of them might kind of look like plants, but they're still animals. They have the features of being a multicellular eukaryotic cells or organism made from eukaryotic cells. They are heterotrophic. That means they do not do photosynthesis. They do not have cell walls. They have full motion of their bodies. Uh, they will have cilia and flagella, typically part of their body plans. Uh, and then they will have a nervous system. Now, I remember we talked earlier about the um, the sending, the touch sensitive plants. Um, they don't have a nervous system the same way that animals have a nervous system. They do have a way to send signals very quickly between their plant cells and cause the plant to move very quickly, like the Venus flytrap can shut its mouth very quickly because of those signals, but it is not a nervous system. It is not the same way that a nervous system occurs in animals. So those are animals. I hope you know what an animal is at this point. Okay, so let's just review all these things for us. We've got prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. So a prokaryotic would be our prokaryota, which our eukaryotic would be everything else. Our protists, our fungi, our plants, and our animals, right? How about this one? Autotrophic and heterotrophic. Let's take a minute. So what are autotrophic and what are heterotrophic? Right, so for our autotrophic, you should put down our protista and our plants. Okay, they are both, there are protists that do photosynthesis and there are plants that do photosynthesis. And then for heterotrophic, we have our prokaryotes, our bacteria, our prosista, there are pro protists as well that are heterotrophic, our fungi, and our animals. Pretty easy, right? Okay, so the last thing we want to talk about is viruses and how do we categorize viruses? Because obviously there was no domain for viruses. And over the years, there have been a lot of people saying that there should be a domain specifically for viruses. There should be something, some taxonomy done for viruses. Uh, and typically, viruses, we do have a category system for them, uh, but it's not exactly the same as the, the binomial taxonomy that you've seen for all of their forms of life. And that basically comes down because the viruses, we're not really sure we're going to be considering them living things or not. They don't have the characteristics of a living thing like everything else uh, that we see on Earth. So we don't necessarily consider them to be living things, but we st can still organize them. We can still categorize them based on uh, physical characteristics or perhaps maybe how they reproduce or what types of diseases they cause. So the most common methods are going to be uh, looking at the shape and the structure of the virus, uh, its size, its method of replication. Is it lysogenic cycle or is it the lytic cycle? Uh, what type of hosts does it infect? Does it host infect mammals? Uh, if it's mammals, does it infect like maybe only dogs or chickens or only infect humans? Or does it affect plants? What species of plants does it infect? Uh, basically, is it when it affects a host, uh, what type of cycle does it have? Does it take a really long time to cause a disease? Does it take uh, only a few hours to cause a disease? And then what are the symptoms of those diseases? So what there can be different types of um, viruses that cause very, very similar diseases. So we'd have to look at the symptoms that they cause in order to categorize them. The most general category though, and this is the one that you need to know for your curriculum, for the exams, would be that first off we could break them down based on nucleic acid type. So there can be DNA-based viruses or there can be RNA-based viruses. Remember that, uh, for example, HIV is an RNA-based virus. It uses a reverse transcriptase in order to make the DNA section that it's going to infect somebody with where uh, lots of the other viruses that we've talked about before, for example, like poliovirus, um, that would be a DNA-based virus. Uh, and then the number of strands that it has. It is a single strand or is it a double strand? So is it like this, a single strand that's kind of wrapped in on itself? Or is it a double strand, okay, like that? So it could be uh, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA. It could be double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA. Uh, so right there, there's, there's four general categories that we could break uh, viruses down into. So make sure you understand uh, why we don't categorize viruses the way that we do everything else. Uh, 
and uh, these these basic forms of of categorizing them and uh, through our different means through a different system. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the first mix for this unit. Uh, you should have uh, practice questions 1A, 1B, and 1C, and to do those in your notes, and I'll look at them tomorrow, and in class we will uh, go over them and make sure you understand this material uh, before we do like a little, a little revision on some things. All right, so thanks for stopping by.